Hi, welcome to uh, Talking Scuba. I am uh, Advanced Open Water Instructor Bob Shoemaker. I'm Jim Norton. And uh, we're going to be talking about all sorts of different types of diving, from uh, cold, deep wreck diving to uh, shallow, warm reef diving. And uh, we're uh, we're drinking a little beer today. I I'm drinking a, a, a Texas Shiner Bach. And I've got a Founders Port. Very good. So uh, we're, we're going to be uh, drinking and talking about as much scuba diving as possible. Uh, we're excited to have you here today. Uh, speaking of cold water, we are diving today at uh, Versluce Lake here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we cut a big hole in the ice and uh, jumped through. Uh, we had a pretty good dive today, huh, Jim? Oh, it was great. Great visibility. A lot of fun. It was a little bit chilly. I think uh, about 34 degrees underwater. Uh, surface temps, uh, we probably had about 40 degrees above, uh, so we were pretty warm up, up top today. Uh, so it made it not too bad once we got out of the water. Um, we had, uh, like Jim said, we had about 30 foot of visibility. Uh, we saw quite a few crappies and things underneath that. Um, when we do ice diving, of course, we're uh, using a lot of tethers and uh, that sort of thing. Um, part of the lake is actually has open water because of some of the bubblers and things they use on the docks. So, uh, Jim, let's t tell me, tell us about your dive. Well, I dove with a couple of uh, new students, and uh, we dove in the open area, which is uh, the ice doesn't form oh, until about. 30, 40 feet from shore. So we were able to get oh, eight, nine feet deep. And we just, uh, the weed line is there, so there's a lot of fish and uh, underwater life. And we uh, cruise that back and forth until uh, they got cold and come on. Yeah, we, uh, we used the chainsaw this morning. We cut a, a triangle in the ice, uh, pushed that uh, triangle down underneath the ice. Um, so then once we're done, we're able to replace that triangle um, so that it freezes back up around it and, and it's uh, safe for all the ice fishermen. We had uh, quite a few fish out there today. We had uh, some crappie and uh, me and Cam were diving and uh, we saw quite a few um, uh, minnows. We had a big school of minnows that we saw. They've been there the last uh, a couple weeks. And uh, the, the neat thing about uh, Versluce, uh, the lake that we were diving today, is uh, the visibility has gotten better and better and better over the last couple years because they have um, the zebra mussel. The zebra mussel has been introduced there. And uh, that is one um, species that's come over from, I think, the Red Sea or something like that. Um, that started out um, up the St. Lawrence Seaway, got into all the big major Great Lakes, and uh, has spread into a lot of the inland lakes. Um, right behind uh, Versluce Lake is, is the Grand River. Uh, the Grand River flowed up over the embankment and actually flooded uh, the lake about five or six years ago and so now we have those those zebra mussels um, and although they are damaging to boats and um, and docks and and uh, people really don't like them uh, we're they actually do uh, wonders for um, the uh, diving if you look at any of the old video uh, from uh, you know the early 80s or whatever uh, especially in the Great Lakes you'll see how dark it is even the wrecks that we do today maybe in 70 or 80 foot of water. Uh, the visibility uh, now uh, in 2009, 2010 is 100% better. We've got, uh, you know, on, on certain dives, we can get uh, anywhere from uh, 70 to 100 foot of visibility, especially once we get up north towards the Straits of Mackinac and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, it's the only really downside of the for us with the zebra mussels is they're extremely sharp, almost like razor blades. And we, if you touch a lot of stuff, you go through a lot of gloves. Yeah, it uh, they wreak havoc on uh, neoprene. They actually, what I've heard is uh, they've got these new quagga mussels, or however you pronounce them, and they are uh, actually going to outbreed the uh, zebra mussels. So the zebra mussels might go into extinction, and these new mussels, which are a little bit larger, a little more efficient uh, mussel, might actually breed out the uh, zebra mussel. So. Uh, like I said, these are an invasive species, and uh, a lot of the wrecks we do, a lot of the stuff we do, Traverse Bay, um, anytime we're, we're in one of the Great Lakes, one of the uh, major Great Lakes, all you see um, are usually the gobies and, uh, and the zebra mussels. They're just yeah. everywhere. We see uh, 
a lot of the uh, crayfish and things too, which a lot of those are invasive species as well. Um, the uh, one, the new one that uh, we're expected to get is uh, the Asian carp. Um, I know there's a lot of articles out there right now. They're uh, coming up uh, in the Chicago area and, and might actually breach uh, their um, the barriers that they have there. They have these electric shock uh, areas where uh, any fish that gets up there, um, they're shocking them and uh, and trying to eliminate them there. Um, but once those get into the Great Lakes, we're just going to have one more invasive species uh, that um, will be breeding and taking over more habitat uh, that we need for our local and, and indigenous populations. So that's kind of a, a sad deal. Um, Another place that's having a big trouble right now with uh, invasive species is down um, in the uh, in the Caribbean areas as well as up the Atlantic coast. Uh, they're dealing with lionfish. Those lionfish are are just everywhere. Uh, a lot of the reefs, uh, wrecks, and things. Uh, they're just really wreaking havoc on areas and uh, places where they've never been before. They're seeing just hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, excuse me. So what uh, they're doing in uh, certain areas is, uh, like the Cayman Islands, they're actually having spear fishing contests. Um, a couple weeks ago, they had a spear fishing contest. They killed over 600 lionfish. Um, researchers are saying that they're never going to be able to eliminate that. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of a lot of guys like to go out and spear fish, so. Uh, you can kill two birds with one stone uh, or uh, hopefully two lionfish with one spear and um, and uh, have fun doing it at the same time so yeah I understand also that they, in uh, New England they had a big uh, cook-off where they were seeing how the chefs would prepare the lionfish and uh, had a contest during that and apparently it turned out pretty good and I guess they are pretty good to eat so that'll kind of help reduce the numbers if you can get people to eat them. Yeah, uh, a lionfish sandwich may be the next thing we see uh, uh, on the menus at uh, Red Lobster. So, um, I want to mention uh, one of our uh, sponsors here before we get going too far. And uh, please help uh, support our sponsors as there's what they're going to bring uh, us to you every week. Um, our first sponsor is uh, Neutral Dive Gear. Uh, they are the premier scuba diving clothing and apparel brand for men and women who live, dive, and thrive. Uh, have a, uh, they have a new, bold, uh, fresh cross tanks hooded sweatshirt available for uh, purchase. Um, display for all to see your passion for diving. Check out the rest of the air apparel at neutraldivegear.com and use the uh, discount, discount coupon code TALKINGSCUBA at checkout uh, to save 15% off your order. I saw a lot of their stuff. I went to their website. They have some really cool stuff. Um, they've got a, uh, uh, they're calling it like a tattoo t-shirt or something. they got a scuba diver right on the shoulder. It's, they got I some like their really large stuff. t-shirt as well. The, one on the, back, the large uh, design on the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. they've got some cool stuff. Um, and they got, uh, and for the you, uh, you sexy ladies out there, they've got some cute shirts for you too. So uh, check them out. Uh, again, our friends at uh, Neutral Dive Gear, uh, neutraldivegear.com. Under what we've been doing lately, I picked up a really interesting book by Clive Kessler for the, uh, about the uh, Sea Hunters 3. Two, actually, sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good read about some excellent stuff. Uh, I particularly like the uh, part about the uh, griffin, which is the uh, holy grail of shipwrecks in Lake Michigan. It's uh, the very first commercial ship, sailing ship, ever launched or sunk in the Great Lakes. And uh, it's a really good read if you got time for it. It's wonderful. Do you find anything good in it? Yeah, I, they have a they have a lot of interesting stories. They uh, were looking for stuff. Uh, the uh, the twin sisters guns that they had for uh, down in the Alamo. They were looking for those, as well as uh, the ship, the Carpathia. Uh, the interesting thing about the Carpathia that was the uh, first ship that was that uh, was able to help uh, the survivors of the Titanic. Um, and uh, so I think about five years after the incident with the Titanic, when they were rescuing those people. Um, the uh, start of the Great War there. They um, were on their way from uh, over to uh, England, I believe. Um, they had a, a couple of destroyers or a couple of big uh, battleships um, leading this convoy of, of uh, seven other ships, which were, um, they had, uh, you know, uh, just regular citizens. They were traveling with the passenger ships, uh, as well as gear and things like that, that they were traveling with. Um, 
what ended up happening uh, was kind of interesting. Uh, those those battleships or whatever uh, peeled off to go back and get another convoy, and uh, U-boats were uh, lying in wait, uh, ready to shoot. Uh, the Carpathia was uh, was the biggest, largest ship um, uh, at that time uh, in that convoy, and uh, so the U-boat targeted in on that um, and ended up uh, uh, putting three torpedoes into it and uh, eventually sinking it. Uh, Clive ended up going out and uh, finding that shipwreck, and um, I think it was in 500 and some foot of water, so wow. obviously out of, uh, of most divers' hands. And um, so they sent down an ROV, a uh, remote-operated op vehicle. Um, they were able to check that out and kind of uh, see all the uh, different parts of that and actually uh, confirm the identification of the ship. Um, you know, here in Michigan, we're lucky we get to... Um, you know, there's thousands of shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, and uh, a lot of them have not been found, and a lot of them have not been identified. So anytime I hear about uh, stories where they are uh, identifying ships, it's interesting to hear how they identify those ships. Uh, you know, obviously one of the first things they do, um, getting the length of the ship, uh, the width of the ship, you know, the basic things. Yep, the basic measurements of that ship. Um, you know, other things like uh, the, the blades, uh, the blades of the prop. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, it's got uh, three blades, it's got four blades. Um, simple things like that that um, will really give you a solid um, identification and, and confirm the identification of the ship. Uh, I always find that stuff very interesting. In fact, we spend a lot of time in the summer uh, searching for shipwrecks. That we do. Well, I remember last year when we were just off from uh, White Lake out in uh, Lake Michigan, and uh, we had my side scan going, and we found some very interesting formations on the, on the bottom. We didn't know what they were. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Ed Helm, let me, uh, got me a uh, location on the internet where I could look at old newspaper articles. Mm. And I went through that and uh, got very excited because at one time a ship had almost sunk almost floundered there, lost all of their deck cargo. And I thought that's what we had found. But we didn't have time and we'd already dove two or three times. We didn't have enough surface interval to go check it out. So we went out the next time all excited and uh, found a whole bunch of clay formations. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah, it's always fun uh, exploring and, and getting excited even if it's something uh, that's not that interesting. Um, just uh, just finding new stuff, and, and maybe it's been found before, but uh, it's new to you, so it's always exciting. Yeah. Uh, diving on the Great Lakes really is uh, a great time. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, get a hold of Sea Hunters 2 by Clive Cussler, it is available currently on Amazon.com, both in audio version and, um, and uh, in the uh, traditional sense as well. Uh, now that I've had my uh, three beers, I think it's time uh, that we actually have our uh, tip of the week. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about what to wear underneath your wetsuit and uh, what makes you most comfortable. Uh, I do a lot of training. I spend uh, most of the summer in my wetsuit, uh, so I'd end up doing a lot of laundry uh, if I were to um, uh, be taking uh, wearing a bunch of stuff underneath my wetsuit. So I, all I do is uh, I go commando uh, as, as often as possible, uh, and I find that that's the most comfortable. But... Uh, most of the time when we're on the dive boats, uh, we can't go commando. Uh, they do not like uh, they do not like it when uh, you've got uh, your uh, your parts hanging out for all to see. So uh, what uh, I like to do is I'll wear um, you know a pair of uh, board shorts and then underneath that I'll wear um, my compression shorts or or um, or just a, a pair of spandex shorts. That is appreciated. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they don't, uh, like I said, they don't like to see my hairy parts if they don't have to. So, uh, what, uh, uh, so I wear, the, uh, I take those uh, board shorts off. You got me all flustered now. Sorry about I that. Took, uh, <laughs> I take uh, my uh, board shorts off uh, right before I get into my wetsuit. Um, I'm real comfortable under that uh, with just my uh, spandex shorts on, and we're ready to dive. Uh, one time uh, we were, uh, I was helping out with a, another instructor's class, and uh, we're down in the docks, and uh, I had a gal, she was uh, from another dive shop, and I was helping her get out of her wetsuit. And um, I pulled a little bit too hard on her on her um, wetsuit, uh, came off, and uh, more than just her um, wetsuit came off, uh, the bottom half there. 
and uh, it was kind of scary. Uh, I think I was 17 at the time, and uh, she looked like she was trying to smuggle Bigfoot in her bikini. So uh, it was kind of a, uh, an educational uh, exciting time for, uh, for my young eyes. So, uh, that is, uh, the tip of the week and, uh, we'll, uh, hopefully have one of these, uh, next week for you as well. Well, I got, uh, I've got an interesting article I got from, uh, the CBC, the Canadian broadcast channel, uh, about a, uh, a storm that dug up a shipwreck, which kind of reminded me of one of the ships we dive on on a regular basis. Uh, this is off of, uh, Prince Edward Island. It's an old schooner, uh, it was an orange ship. They call it the orange ship because they thought it was bringing uh, cargo uh, up to the north country there from uh, down south. Um, but uh, what it is, basically they have a, uh, a ship that uh, goes in and out of the sand and in and out of the um, ice and they can only see it uh, every few years. So kind of, uh, like I said, reminds me of a ship that we do, the Salvor. Oh yeah, she gets herself uncovered every now and then and we find all kinds of interesting stuff on it. It's uh went down in what 1930 something somewhere around there with uh, a load of stones for the uh, pier yeah it uh, it's a semi whale back so if you're familiar with that um, uh, the whale back design it, it's shaped more like a uh, submarine than anything it's got a rounded side a rounded hull uh, kind of a neat little boat and um, and uh, it's only in about what 25 foot of water something like that about 25 foot of water and uh, right off uh, the Muskegon Harbor there. And it's a real easy dive. A lot of guys don't like to do it, but what we find really neat about it is from uh, year to year, uh, from uh, even from uh, beginning of the season to the end of the season, the sand will wash in and out. And uh, we found some pretty neat stuff on that wreck. We have, we found uh, what we think is piece of the belt. Uh, we found uh, equipment, uh, all kinds of, uh, oh, the ribs from the structure of the uh, ship. And uh, it just, it's, it's kind of a treat. Every time you dive it, it's something different. That's uh, also the place of the uh, inf infamous bone find. Um, oh, yeah. We were, uh, <laughs> we're diving along and uh, Jim's actually running video. And I'm rooting around and, and just uh, digging through the, the debris and stuff like that. And I see what I think is a piece of iron. So I kind of swim over to it. and. I grab it and pull it out, and it's actually a uh, human femur bone. Um, so obviously we don't want to disturb any uh, uh, remains or anything like that, and uh, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. So there's a video of me just dropping it and kind of swimming backwards as fast as I can. Um, that uh, I wish that video had sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you probably hear me scream like a girl. Uh, I wasn't, yep. uh, it's not something we want to uh, do on a regular basis, uh, you know, disturbing remains like that, but uh, I think there was uh, five hands lost on that ship, and uh, and that's the case with a lot of the shipwrecks, uh, whether in the Atlantic, uh, Pacific, or, or here in the Great Lakes, um, there are, uh, lo you know, sometimes significant loss of life, and uh, we have to take that into consideration anytime that we're diving on those ships. Yep, we want to make sure we give it the respect that it deserves, and... Uh but uh, it's, it, shipwrecks like that usually with that much sand blowing and covering them up and uncovering them there's really very little you usually find yeah we uh, yeah we're pretty lucky with that shipwreck to find as much as we have um, with the uh, the uh, remains and stuff like that uh, here in Michigan we're, we're lucky that we have all the laws in place um, we have a lot of uh, preserves and things like that to make sure that people aren't just uh, going in and, and essentially raping the uh, these uh, you know historic sites and taking all the uh, stuff off the wrecks uh, so that they can be enjoyed for uh, you know for generations to come. Uh, certainly, there are there is deterioration that's happening on these shipwrecks, um, but but like I said, you know we live in probably one of the best places in the world to to dive on shipwrecks because we don't have the hurricanes. When the hurricanes come through, they're going to tear up your shipwreck. Um, when uh, you, you're uh, in fresh water, you don't have the worms and things that are going to eat away at the uh, wood. Um, and uh, you know now we have the zebra mussels, which are kind of encrusting everything, um, but it's not as significant as, as let's say, coral uh, or, or other things that grow down, down in, in the south or in the salt water. That's the nice thing about the silver is because it gets so much sand. Uh, on it and off from it and eroding it, there's there's very little zebra mussels, if any at all. 
So that's one nice thing about that. I think uh, one of the uh, most interesting stories I've heard in the last couple of years was actually about the um, the Spiegel Grove when we were down in, in Key West or in Key Largo last year oh, yeah. uh, diving with Conk Republic divers. And um, we were down there and uh, diving with a guy, his name's Sammy. Um, he's actually uh, uh, from Rhode Island originally. And uh, he was telling us about uh, when they first sunk um, the Spiegel Grove, they actually sunk it um, as, a, as an artificial reef and it was actually turned upside down um, to, they wanted to get it righted, so they hired a company somewhere from New England area uh, to build these humongous lift bags um, so that they could get it righted as much as possible. Well, if you've, if you've dove the Spiegel Grove, you'll know that there's quite a heavy current there, so um, it, it, very, very difficult up, uh, a d very difficult project for them to, uh, to take on. But anyways, they had these huge lift bags. They were able to actually lift the, the boat. It's 500 and some foot long, really long ship, extremely heavy, but they got it up. Um, they got it onto its side. That was the extent, uh, that was as far as they could do it. Um, and this is in about 100 and some foot of water, uh, yeah. low hundreds, 110, 120 foot of water. What happened is the currents were, were um, uh, running uh, parallel with the ship, or um, uh, yeah, parallel with the ship and um, kind of started to dig it out a little bit. And uh, over the course of time, it dug a pretty heavy trench. Um, one of the big hurricanes came through and they went back to dive on the ship and all of a sudden the Spiegel Grove is upright. So that shows you how much power uh, a hurricane can actually have in uh, uprighting a ship uh, of such a significant size. Yeah. That was a really fun, uh, fun dive. We got, we probably had 40, 50 foot of visibility. Um, I recommend that ship. Uh, it's a little bit deeper, so you do need your uh, advanced open water uh, certification uh, from whatever agency uh, you might be trained for. Um, but I definitely re recommend diving down in the Keys. A good time, uh, warm water. Uh, you could see lots of different life and stuff like that. We had a really oh, yeah. good time. Good time. I, I particularly like the Duane. That was a very excellent wreck. Yeah, we saw quite a few uh, different types of fish on that. I think... Uh, That's where we've seen the big Jewfish. Big Jewfish. Uh, Goliath Grouper, I think they have to call it now, uh, to be completely <laughs> politically correct. Um, but uh, we also had um, uh, tons of Barracuda and stuff. That was another oh, place we saw the Barracuda. Yeah. Uh, so that was a fun dive. Um, Probably uh, barracuda in the hundreds, just tons nice. and tons of barracuda. We, uh, what are some of the other ones we dove down there? Uh, oh, gosh. The eagle. The, the eagle is uh, the one that's split right in half. Right. Uh, and, and that's like where we saw side. the turtle there. We saw a real big yep. turtle. Uh, we actually had a big group go through before us. Um, uh, they had a guide. They were all following the guide. And um, they had a... Uh, um, they completely missed the turtle. Yeah. Uh, there was 15 or 20 of them just following uh, this dive guide, and uh, we uh, went in behind them and uh, were able to just uh, see that turtle. Um, it was kind of it was probably there the whole time. They just all missed it, so yeah. that was pretty fun. Um, uh, what else did we dive? We did a lot of reef diving there as well. Yes, a lot of reefs. Uh, molasses reef. Uh, that was an excellent reef. Uh, a lot of fish. Got a chance to see uh, some uh, nurse sharks. Yeah, we had uh, we actually had a Canadian guy on the boat. Um, nothing against all of our Canadian viewers, uh, but uh, he came down and uh, there was a nurse shark sleeping uh, down in the reef, and uh, he uh, what he grabbed right hold of the tail, didn't he? He grabbed hold of the tail to get it to swim. <laughs> yeah, he wanted swimming. he wanted to get a good video of it, so uh, he went down and grabbed. Uh, grab the tail of it, which is obviously not something uh, that is recommended by anybody. Uh, even though it is a nurse shark, it's obviously very dangerous. And uh, it's just trying to chill out, hang out, have a good time uh, in its natural environment. Leave it alone. You don't need to bother it. It's not doing anything to you. Um, we're there to observe. Uh, we're going down into uh, a place that's uh, it's not our home. Um, we're uh, invading their territory. So uh, leave the wildlife alone. Uh, we're just there to watch it. So. I want to thank everybody for joining us this week on uh, Talking Scuba, and we will be here next week. Uh, we had a really good time, and this is our first show, so um, we hope to be here for uh, many years to come. So uh, cheers to you, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Thanks a lot. To the next dive. To the next dive.